Hello, everyone. This is Sean from the Soccer Nostalgia blog. I have the pleasure to interview Portuguese author and journalist, Mr. Miguel Lorenzo Pereira. Uh, Mr. Pereira has appeared in the podcast uh, before discussing the history of the Portugal national team. Mr. Pereira's books include the following. Sueños de la Euro, el torneo que reconcilió en continente, 2021. Noches europeas, historia de las competiciones europeas de clubes, from 1897, 2015. And Sonos Durados, 20 mundiales, 20 historias. I hope I pronounced this okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> well enough, well enough. Yeah. This interview is separate from the podcast series. This video interview will serve as a companion piece to a written blog presentation uh, on the 1970s and 80s Portugal star, Benfica and Portugal star, Fernando Chalana. Hello, Miguel. Thank you for this interview. Hello. Thank you for having me. So let's start at the beginning. What was Chalana's youth like and his subsequent formation at Barreirense, and then his transfer to Benfica as a teenager. Okay, so Solano, born in 59, was brought up in an area that was a very working class uh, area uh, near Lisbon, on the left bank of the River Tejo, that's where all the shipyards, all the great industries, of what was known as the south margin of the river or the south area of Lisbon were. So basically, it, w it was a very red belt zone uh, after the 25th of April 1974 until today still is an area uh, mostly controlled by the Communist Party of Portugal. So it's a very left wing area and always was. So his upbringing was in that circumstance with a very humble origins. Uh, he spent like Almost the kids of his generation playing the streets for a very young age uh, while their fathers worked on, on the shipyards, on the factories around. And there was a lot of talent uh, of Portuguese football that was growing in that same area. He was born very near a place where, for instance, Manuel Vento, the greatest Portuguese goalkeeper of that generation, uh, even Paulo Futre was going to be his successor in, in terms of um, stardom and quality of Portuguese football was born in Montijo, which like five kilometers uh, more inwards uh, the Tejo. So it was an area where even Figo is born in Almada, which is also very near. So this is an area where the Portuguese talent grow faster and, and most because there was still a very humble background, South American style of growing, still a lot of people in the streets, warm weather, so they could play outside a lot. And Shalana was brought in that circumstance. He was always the king of the football street. He played for money since a very young age, so, so he could play uh, with his friends, buy some Coca-Colas and some sweets because their fathers couldn't afford. So he usually went to local teams and have them play for, for money to see which one would, would won the, the football matches in the streets. And the clubs around the area started to take notice. He was a fan of the Portuguese club Kuf was a club from a factory from around the same area of Barreiro. He went to the matches with his uncle and he was going to make a trial there, but then he was refused. Nobody really knows why, because his talent was very clear for everyone. And then in the end, he opted for Barreirense, which is the other club of the local area, and his, his impact was immediate. And in the end, he ended up in Benfica because, well, everyone started to talk about it, Benfica and Sporting, were always closing in on players from that area because a lot of talent was growing up there. And the historical Benfica captain, Mario Coluna, who was already working as a scout. He had ended his career uh, a few years ago. He played in, in Lyon in France before coming back to Portugal after his large spell with Benfica. And he was uh, trying to check out some players, some youth players in the area. He spot on Shalana when he was only 14. He told him about it to the Benfica coach, Pavic, a Serbian coach, and they went to see him play and they were immediately in love with him. So Benfica signed him without even he knowing it. Uh, they negotiated directly with Bacherians. The Sporting also was trying to make a bid, but it was not as good as Benfica's. So in the end, with 15, uh, already a, a star in the making, he started to play with the, the Benfica youth teams. Let's remind everyone that at this point, the Benfica of the 1960s and Eusebio was over. And while domestically they would still win titles, uh, 
they were no longer a force at European level. And uh, so how was Chalana's progress around this time, bearing this in mind? Well, the thing is, Befica mm, spent the greatest part of the 70s winning with relatively ease in the Portuguese league. They won several titles until 1978 when Porto started to appear on, on the same scene. And they usually shared titles with Sporting. Befica would won three titles and then Sporting would won one. And then again, Befica three and Sporting one. That was almost during the 60s and the 70s, the dynamics of Portuguese football. And Benfica was still the greatest powerhouse in, in the nation. And although they were left behind like all Latin football in the 70s uh, with the, the change of pace and the technical and tactical changes brought up by the Northern Europe teams, by the Dutch teams, by the German teams, and later on by the British teams as well. In, in the South, Benfica was still considered a powerhouse. And in Portugal, the demand on Benfica was huge. Uh, fellow friend of mine who, which whom I record a podcast Fever Page João Gonçalves was brought up in that same uh, generation and he was used to as a kid to see the fans booing Benfica players even if the team was winning because they weren't winning beautifully enough they weren't being able to match the magic of the years of the 60s it was like a Nora on the 70s uh, late 70s generation early 80s that they had to do the same thing that the generation of Eusebio and Coluna and Simões and José Augusto and Torres did in the 60s. So the people were very demanding. Most of all, the what they known as the Tercera Nel, the third ring of the Luz Stadium, which was already one of the biggest stadiums in the world back then and was going to become bigger thanks to Shalan as well. Uh, they That was a very demanding culture. And when he goes to that locker room, because he goes to Benfica with 15, but after two years, he starts practicing already with the first team because the quality was was evident to everyone to see. And that generation of young players that were coming into the team, although much some of older than them, like Nene, for instance, and Shell and Alvaro, and, and players of that, that stardom quality, uh, they started to feel that the fans in Benfica not only demanded wins, not only demanded titles, but they demanded winning with style. And being a flair player, being a player that was able to encapsulate the imagination of the fans, they immediately fall in love with Shalana the first time he saw him. In the second half of a Portuguese league match with the Ferenc, he substitutes uh, the local legend Tony, who later will become also a manager of the team. And people immediately fall in love in the way he, he could play. Everybody thought he was a left winger, a uh, left footer, but he was actually a right footer player. Uh, but he could play with both feet very naturally. He was always wounded up uh, defenders. He was always looking for the, the extra pass, the beautiful move. And for play, uh, for fans who were used to the genius quality of Eusebio, he was the one that was more resembling in doing something is out of the blue, extraordinary. And in the end, he was the symbol of that transitional generation of post Eusebio until the mid-80s when Benfica started to lose their position in, in the powerhouse of the Portuguese football to Porto. So, not shortly after making the first team at Benfica, he was called up by the national team while still a teenager. Can you describe this period? Yeah, well, uh, he was champion in the same year uh, with the youth team of Benfica and with the, national, uh, the first team of Benfica. And in the same year, he played with the uh, under-19, under-21, and the national team. So his impact was immediately. The national coach of Portugal at the time was José Maria Pedrot, who was a Porto legend. But he was also uh, a coach that could spot talent uh, for miles. And he not only was called a few weeks after his debut with Benfica, but he also played the game, uh, his first uh, international appearance back then. And it was evident for all that he was a player to to be a regular part of the national team for the decade to come, alongside other young starlets like Antonio Oliveira, Fernando Gomes from Porto, and also Jordão from Benfica and Nene Manuel Fernandes from Sporting. There was a generation that will ended up shining for themselves in the year '84 that we talked in the last podcast that started to appear in the national team through Pedroto in in, in those years. And uh, the only problem that Salana had. It was not his youth, but his uh, injury proneness. Because in the end, uh, although his later career is very damaged by the injuries he, he had after the year 84, uh, 
uh, already in the 70s, you actually have like two or three injuries a year. He never made a season without a, I would say, not serious injury, but an injury that would keep him off the, the field for like two or three months. So in the end, that, in the sense, uh, made it more difficult to impose himself in the national team earlier than he really did in the late 70s and early 80s. So before being noticed at the European level, Charlotte won three league titles with Benfica in 1976, 1977, and 1981. Can you describe this period of his career? It was basically entering in a, a conquering team, like like I said before, the, the Benfica team. He, he gets to in 77, were, had been champions the year previously. And despite Sporting having won the league in 74, they won the third, the leagues from 71 to 74. And it was basically the same core team. So it was a, a team usually to win. But then in 77, 78, everything changes in Portuguese football. Porto uh, started to win titles. Porto was not winning titles since 1960, uh, 1960 with Bella Goodman still as their head coach. So they spend a long drought of titles for 19 years, but then Pedroto moves to Porto, uh, despite being also the national team coach. Pinto da Costa is still the president of Porto, starts to take charge first as a sporting director, later on as president. And Porto starts to uh, appear as the greatest rival of Benfica, surpassing sporting. And in those years, Benfica is a very good team. They even lose the title without losing any match that season. They lose the title on one point because they have uh, four draws and Porto only has one defeat and one draw. So it's like uh, what happened at the same time, for instance, with Perugia in, in Serie A. They also lost the title against Milan because they had like uh, seven draws uh, and all and only victories, uh, but no defeat. Right? That Benfica team was a very competent one. They had a lot of flair in attack. But the capacity of Porto to compete was new for them, so they spent those like three, four years between 1978, 1982 uh, suffering, and then everything changes when in 1982 uh, arrives to to the Luz, uh, the Swedish coach uh, Sven Goran Eriksson, and he like makes a after and before moment in the history of the club and launches what would be a, a very great decade for Benfica in the, in the second half of the eighties. Uh, so. The first glimpse of Shalana getting attention outside of Portugal was during Benfica's UEFA Cup run in 1982-83, where they lost in the final to Anderlecht. But again, they won the league once more that season. Was this his real breakthrough at European level? Yeah, yeah, and definitely, because Benfica played at European level since his, since his start. But as we said before, we were talking about late 70s, early 80s. That was the period of British domination in European football, but also German and Dutch presence. And not only Benfica, but also Real Madrid and Italian champions, being Juventus, being Lazio, AC Milan. Uh, they always suffered in European football back then. Uh, so the great power teams of the 60s were having difficulty to compete with teams uh, with much less history, like Nottingham Forest, like Aston Villa, for instance, from England, Eintracht Frankfurt, and Moschelalbach, Kohn from Germany, even PSV and Feyenoord and, and Ajax were still there. So in the end, Shalana played European football since a very early age, but Benfica wasn't able to progress to the final stages. So he wasn't able to make an impact in a period of time when people usually didn't knew players from other countries, except uh, when they played in World Cups, when they played in the Euros, or when were they played in European Cup finals. And reaching the European Cup final of the, the UEFA Cup in 82-83, and all that year's campaign when Benfica played against Roma, who had a very good team already with Bruno Conti, with Graziani, with Falcao, that were going to end up winning the Scudetto of playing the Euro Cup final with Liverpool in the year after. So it was a power in the making as well in the Italian football. And those victories first signals uh, a lot of names of Portuguese football that were a little bit under the radar. And Salana, of course, was one of them being the star of that team. A team that is probably the 82-84 Benfica team with Ericsson. Probably the, sec the second greatest team in the history of Benfica, only uh, after the, the team of Eusebio. So it was a very, very good team, very attacking-minded team. Ericsson changed a lot of things in the club, uh, especially on the training sessions, on the professional lifestyle of the players, and the way he dominated those two years in Portuguese football. Also elevated Solana uh, 
as a cold title, not only in Portugal, but also uh, around Europe as well. It would be the following season, 1983-84, where Shalana would be at his absolute peak and would gain international recognition with uh, Portugal's run in the 1984 Euros, where they reached the semifinals. Can you describe his Euros and level of fame at this point? Well, he, he won the league with, with Benfica. He actually had a pretty good run in the European Cup, but they were eliminated by Liverpool, who ended up winning the competition. So no shame in that at all. But then the Euros were a very strange period for Portuguese football. As we talked already, it was a national team that had like four coaches, uh, a national team coach and three other coaches that had uh, that represented one of the age three big clubs in Portugal, Benfica, Porto and Sporting. Uh, the lineups were made by agreement between the coaches so that, that every club was represented. There was a lot of... Uh, backstage uh, fight between even the players. Some didn't even talk to one another because of the wars between Porto and Benfica for the past few years, uh, trying to get the the most of the strange uh, dilemmas of Portuguese football in the back room. So in the end, it was a team nobody expected to prevail. Even the way they reached the European Cup, the, the Euros was a very troublesome one because it was a penalty that Shalana gained against the Soviet Union outside of the area, so it was not even a penalty. And if there was a VAR back then, it was probably Portugal never reached out the Euros 84 as well. So nobody expected Portugal to shine. And the first matches uh, against uh, uh, Germany and against Spain were uh, matches where Portugal really didn't shine at all, but they competed. They competed well. It was a tough group, also with Romania. In the last match with the, the triumph against the Romanians uh, made them to be uh, in the semi-final with the, the favorite France. And that is the match that encapsulates that generation, that makes the name of Shalana. Because although we performed well in the first three three games, it's the, the match in Marseille, that confrontation with Platini's France and Tiganas and Jerez and all that stardom team that the French had and went up to, to winning the Euros. Uh, the way he assists the, the goals of Portugal, uh, the way he cruises around the flanks, and explores the areas that really made him one of the greatest individual performance in the history of the Euros. And that obviously caught everybody's attention. He was still a very young player at the time, uh, although people already knew him from the Benfica season where they reached the UEFA Cup final. That was the moment that Europe as a whole fell in love with Shalana. The French press, uh, because of his moustache and because of his short height, started to call him Shalanix because of the similarities with Asterix, the, the popular comic uh, character of Goscinny. He was already known in Portugal as the Pequeno Genial, the little genius, because of his height again and the, the ability he had to make things appear out of nowhere. But of course, it's that match against France, one of the best matches in the history of European football, that really puts him in the radar. And there was already some clubs that was interested in him in signing him, uh, especially Barcelona back in 82. But in the end, they opted for Maradona and who could blame them, although it didn't happen as both expected uh, at the time. But uh, it was an obvious choice. But then in 84, again, Michelin started to cut a, a lot of eyes in European football. And it was uh, very clear that uh, Portugal was uh, too small for a player of that statue. And he was doomed to great things. And unfortunately for him, for the football, uh, it never really happened. Now, um, his wife, Annabella, who was also his agent, was often compared to Gabby Schuster, the wife of Bern Schuster. Can you describe how the press viewed her and her management of his career? They were they were the same. Uh, Annabella and Gabby, they, they had... A huge control on their husbands' lives and and careers. They both acted not only as agents, but they were ever present in every situation. They were at every match. They were at every negotiation table. She had uh, a great influence in Shalana as a person as well. So in the end, she was uh, very decisive. Uh, for instance, and Shalana had a tough relationship with Ericsson because Ericsson, already back in the day, had a, had an agent and he always liked to make some moves on the side. And he wanted Shalana to come to, to Rome 
because he already knew that he was going to coach Rome after leaving Benfica. And he tried to persuade him, but the, the Rome offer uh, was uh, with some money on the side for the agent that was going to end up in Ericsson's pocket. Annabella found out, so he said that he wouldn't go to the Rome team and started to look for other options. That didn't end it well with the last months with, uh, with Ericsson in the team. So she was very tough in the negotiation tables. Uh, he was at one point... Uh, near to go to Sporting uh, because his contract was running out and she obliged Benfica to pay him more than they really expected to do because Shalane as a man was a very humble man. His humble background was always there with him. He was a person that had no great ambition than to play football. He was not looking for stardom. He was not looking for fortune. And Annabella kind of made up for that. She was uh, the person that was always ready to grab a few dollars more and very... Uh, to make the deal more positive for him. And then she had a, a real time in Bordeaux so, uh, because in that team that was the beginning of a project, uh, she was the only female around. The other players always had male agents and like happened also with Schuster in, in Barcelona and then in Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid. Uh, it was a very disturbing for a world dominated by men to have such a power figure in in a woman to be present in the negotiation stable, to be conceding interviews to the press. And so, uh, like we know in the, in the football world, there was always some reports uh, trying to uh, undermine her position and trying to make her look like a negative uh, influence in, in the player's life. But in the end, she was always there trying to get the best for both of them, like, like a couple would normally do. But it was such a novelty at the time. Still is nowadays. Uh, there are a lot of uh, there are a few women football agents still today, but back in the day it was stranger even. So both Gabby and Anabella were like uh, two drops in the ocean. Yeah, and uh, one of the criticisms of Annabella was that uh, when that she traveled to France during the Euros and was accredited as a journalist, that's something that was kind of brought up in the press a lot. Shalana himself he claimed that she had changed his life for good, and. Uh, they were married in November of 82 with Filipovic as a witness. Oh, no, yeah, that's, uh, that's right. She, she changed him because when he started to play at Benfica, he used to go to the trainings with the other player in a bus. There were Bento would drive a bus uh, and collect several players that lived in the same area and they would go all together. That would bond the team spirit and such. And when Annabella came, Shalana started to live a more ostentatious life, uh, more of a star-like uh, life. And she actually changed his perception of how a football should uh, be paid and how he should be treated. The way she went to the Euro 84, the Fed Portuguese Federation didn't allow the families of the players to be in France. So she, wa she wanted to be near him. She got a newspaper to credit her as a, a news journalist to give him a uh, clearance to be at the press conference and to be near the hotel so she could be near him. She wasn't in the same room, but she was there sleeping and they were seeing each other every day. And it was like, it was a, a character that was uh, against the tide. And that was the, th the thing that most people weren't expecting to have a woman in the world's man to behaving with such uh, easiness like she did. And that impacted a very shy people, a very shy person like Shalana was, and so most of the people started to to sell the image that she controlled his life and that he was a puppet in her hands. But in the end, they always did everything by what they believe were right for both of them. So it was in the spring summer of 1984 that Shalana had decided to leave Benfica. Can you explain the whole story around the false contract with Boa Vista? Yeah, well, basically in 84, his relationship with Ericsson was going sour because uh, Ericsson really wanted him to move to Italy because he knew he was going to be there. Uh, so Shalan was looking for other options. He knew that it was time to leave Benfica even before the year 84. Benfica was in a very tough uh, financial situation because back in the day, uh, clubs only had the money uh, coming from football transfers and football transfers fees were very different from what they are today and from the tendencies at matches in Benfica even having one of the biggest stadiums in the world uh, and wanting to finish the stadium uh, the Portuguese economical situation back then was not very famous so the team uh, even performing very well wasn't able to return as much money as the club needed so in the end it was a move 
that interested both parties. And Solanus tried started to look for options abroad. He talked with Roma because of the Ericsson influence. He talked with Barcelona as well. He started to see if there were clubs interested. We must remember that back in the day, the, there were some markets that were or closed or open for a few years ago because of the limitation of the European players uh, in teams. So Italy only had allowed foreign players to be signed uh, three years before. And in the first year, there was only one foreign player. In the second year, there was only two. Uh, in English football, uh, there was still not a culture of uh, bringing in players from continental Europe. There were very, very few examples like Thyssen and, and Arnsen with Ipswich and Ardelius and Ricky Villa with uh, Tottenham, but they were the exception. Also in German football, in Dutch football, and French football as well, there was still a very uh, distant world of what we know today as players moving with ease within Europe. So Shalana didn't have that much option. And Boavista, who was a club that was trying to be uh, a power inside Portuguese football, thanks to the influence of their new appointed president, Valenti Loredo, who was going to end up being president of the Portuguese league in the 90s. And his son will be the person that was going to guide Boavista to their only title in 2001. So he started to invest in the club. And one of the ideas was to bring a player uh, of the level of Shalana. And he was negotiation, negotiating his, his contract with Benfica. Uh, that was going to end in, in 84. And Bovista appeared with a very interesting economical offer. But what Shalana did, he was never interested in staying in Portugal. Because for him to stay in Portugal was to stay with Benfica. Uh, not to move to a club that was still... Uh, a power in the making. There was he was fighting to be in the top three, but regularly with them up in four, fifth, sixth in the table. So that was not the move he wanted. And he used the Boavista offer as leverage to renegotiate his contract with Benfica. He managed so. So Benfica ended up paying him more than they expected. But in the end, after eighty four, they got that back when they agreed to sell him to to Bordeaux. Getting back to um, his relationship with the then Benfica manager Sven Goran Eriksson, he's he had other problems with him as well. Um, can you do you remember some of them? Well, basically, he, he always says of Eriksson that he was a very very good coach in the technical sense and the tactical sense, but he was not a very good man management coach. And he had a great relationship with Tony, who was the second in command in, in the Eric's team, but he had a very feeble relationship with, uh, with the Swedish. And in the end, it was like a power struggle between the two of them, uh, especially after the UEFA Cup final in, in 82. So that year, 83, 84, was a very tense year between both. And also because he, he already knew that Ericsson was going to leave, that was going to start to make money with some of the player moves that it didn't end up well with him. So they never really get along, uh, both of them. And there's a story that uh, Ericsson wanted to advance Glenn Stromberg. Basically, Ericsson, he wanted Stromberg to have the number 10 jersey. So Ericsson and Stromberg even promised money to Shalana for the number 10 jersey. Do you know about this if the story is true? It's probably a myth because the numbers back in the day were not signed for players. Uh, and in the end, they usually play with the number uh, in the, at, the, at the same day match. And Shalana was using the 10 for the past six years. So it's very hard because it was not a coach decision to whom which uh, had to, number to use. And in Benfica, like every Portuguese club, it's a very presidentialist club. So most of those decisions are done not by the coaches, but by the presidential staff. And alongside with the players, the coaches are left a little bit on the margin side. It's not like the manager culture in English football. So it's very hard for a coach to to promise a number to a certain player, especially back in the day where Solano was the star of the team and everybody wanted him uh, to see him on the 10 shirt. It was a number that uh, was always a part of him throughout his career, except on Euro 84, because then the numbers were given to the players because of their name, basically. The, there was no correlation between the, the numbers given the positions in the field. But back in, in the football club, mm, Shalana always used the 10. There was never an end of uh, losing him the number and no point because Ericsson wouldn't have the power to, to make that change happen. So, 
the fame from the 1984 Euros would earn him a transfer to Bordeaux, the recent French champions. However, he struggled with injuries that first season, 1984-85. And in fact, in his entire three seasons there, he would suffer with injuries. And he rarely featured and fell into obscurity there. Now, what really happened with his injuries? Okay, so he's, he was always an injury-prone player, even back in the day in Benfica. Ever since he was a very young, uh, the way he played, uh, it was like very Neymar in the, in today's game. He was always looking for that that move that irritates defenders, that some at times make defenders going to to grab you just for the sake of it. And in the eighties, in the seventies, the defenders could do that and walk away with no punishment at all. There were tough years for flair players, especially in European football. So. In the end, Shalane always suffered with those ankles and with those knees because of the, the way defenders marked him so deeply. And he always had that issue. But in Benfica, he always had uh, medical staff that uh, managed to get him fit. And he always had a very good relationship with the physios and with uh, all the staff behind. And that he didn't have at Bordeaux. He always told that Bordeaux was a very interesting project in the way that Claude Bess the new club's president, who had been appointed a few months before, really wanted to build uh, a power club in European football. And in a way, he did with all the signings that that Bordeaux made for the new appointed manager, Ramé Jacquier, who was also starting his, his coaching career back in the day. Uh, and they had a lot of infrastructures that were uh, worthy of a club of the elite. But at the same time, he also said that the medical staff in Bordeaux was just shambles. And there were a lot of players that had physical problems, especially the ones that came from other clubs and other realities. They always thought that the Bordeaux was lacking on the human and professional quality on that on that side. And being an injury-prone player as he was before, he always uh, suffered more than most back in, in those years. He even tried in several occasions to ask permission for the club's, uh, for the club's president to come back to Lisbon and be treated by the physicians in Benfica that he already knew. But Claude Bess uh, uh, even fined him uh, sometimes when he proposed that because he would say that the the Bordeaux uh, medical staff was superior to the Benfica ones, which in reality they weren't. And in the end, it just kept on uh, accumulating small injuries that wouldn't able make him able to make him fit. He would uh, pick up an injury, be out like for two months, come back, play three matches, pick another injury, and it will start on that negative dynamic. And in the end, it was very hard for him to get like two, two or three months playing uh, to get physical condition. And uh, also the opponents already knew of his problem, so they would uh, play to that when they were marking him. And in the way we're talking about a player that was all flair, was all technique, uh, had a very good speed, and when you don't have the physical uh, side uh, healthy enough to make you be able to provide that kind of technical quality, then you start to lose confidence on yourself. You start to doubt more and you start losing that magical point of your game that you make the difference. And that's what happened in the three years he was at Bordeaux. And uh, given his injury problems at Bordeaux, he was at a contention with the national team and missed the 1986 World Cup. During this period, were there any attempts to reintegrate him or was he forgotten? No, no, he was always always on the pre-lists. Uh, everybody knew that Shalana was, was the key figure in Portuguese football still. But uh, the injuries were just there and they were never able to get him fit to play with the national team for more than two matches in those in that period of time. At the same time, that's the explosion of Paul Futre in, in Porto. He started to accumulate uh, matches uh, with the team, although being very young. So that kind of player was already there when Shalana wasn't fit. And in the end, they almost never played one another in the, in the national team because whenever Futre was, was good to play, Shalana was out injured. When Shalana was called up, Futre as being young was demoted to the under-21 team. So it was a really shameful that Portugal at Mexico 86 wasn't able to have both Futre and Shalana playing alongside each other. That would provide a more attacking flair and 
probably would change the destiny of that generation because after uh, 86 uh, the problems with Saltillo with the the federal with the federation of portuguese football against some of the players most of them were banned to play for the national team for the following years and in the end that almost destroyed the generation of 84 and Shalana, even when he came back to portugal uh, was never in contention again to play except when they didn't have enough players to go, that's why he, he played one more game with the national team. Because back in those years, with so much uh, star players suspended, they had to sometimes call up players from second tier and third tier teams and players that were not stars in their teams like Solana. That was not a regular start at Benfica, but was, still had an important name. So he was called up to play a match, I, I believe, against Sweden. And in, in the end, uh, it was more because of that than of his uh, importance uh, at uh, Portuguese football after so many years of accumulated injuries and losing uh, physical and technical shape. So he ended his spell in Bordeaux in somewhat anonymity. Uh, his side Bordeaux were all conquering in France and did win the league and cup titles in his time there but he rarely featured. He returned to Benfica in 1987 at his lowest ebb. What was this period back at Benfica like? When he left Benfica, uh, the money left uh, on the club, man, uh, able to complete the style of Luz third ring. So he had that importance in the, in the history of the club, the same way, like for instance, Kubala had on building the, the Camp Nou. Shalana helped to end up the, the state of the loose and uh, people never really knew what was happening in France. They knew he was injury, but since the there were no television match, uh, there was no internet. So for most of the Benfica fans, Solana was still the old Solana. And when they signed him back, people were very, very expecting to see the, the tricky, the flair player that they once knew. So the first match against Salgueiros, the, the stadium was overcrowded. People really wanted to see the prodigal son come back. And that Benfica team was also a very good team. They ended up playing the 87-88 uh, European Cup final against PSV. They are going to play also against Milan in 89-90, in the final. So they were a team that were back in contention in European football with different players than the ones he knew of his time. There, there was a lot of changes back in the day. Uh, Ericsson even come back as a coach uh, as well in 89-90, in 88-89 in to win the championship, in 89-90 to go to the European Cup final. So people started to think that was possible to all that, uh, having the medical staff of Benfica, having a, a team that was already a very good team, having a coach that, despite their personal differences, brought up the best Shalana had to offer as a player. They were starting to believe that it could be the old Shalana, but it, was, it wasn't meant to be. Physically, he was already in disarray. Yeah, the, the quality of the team was very good. He could never get three, four matches in a row playing. He was a very different player. He had lost speed. He had lost the ability to win the one-twos like he did. So he ended up being a backup player of that, of that squad. He played not as many games as he probably wanted. He always played more in football league at home, where Benfica was always the dominant figure than play when Benfica traveled around the country, when they would find more tough opposition. Uh, it was more a player for the fans in the sense that he was always there when the Stade de Luz was full, but he was not playing against sports. So he was not playing against sporting. He was not playing the tough matches at European football because he wasn't able to deliver what people expect of him. Yes, uh, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, he just played like just over 30 matches in three years in his uh, spell back with Benfica. And he left Benfica for a second time in 1990 to wind down his career, first at Belenenses in 1990-91 season, and then Estrella Amadora in 91-92 season. And again, he barely played in either of those two seasons. And what was this final stage of his career like? Well, both clubs, Belenenses was a historical club in Portuguese football, had won the, the Portuguese Cup the year previously. And Estrada Amadora also won the, the, the Portuguese Cup in 1990. So there were teams that were going to play in Europe. There were teams that were expecting to sign uh, a name 
more than a player. They wanted that uh, Shalana could be able to bring people to the stadium just because of the appeal he still had. Uh, he wanted to see the impact he would have on, on the back room, the appeal he would have with the younger players bringing him up because uh, despite of all the injuries, he was still training uh, with all his technical abilities. He was uh, very much still a very humble player, so he never posed like a, a diva. Uh, he was ready to help out the ones that were playing, especially the young ones. And that's why, in the end, he, he always preferred to coach kids than to coach uh, grown-ups. He had a very good relationship with the younger players. And those clubs really tried to brought that uh, l -Sid image of even when in his last final breath, he was able to command and he was able to inspire people around him. But uh, his health was already in a very bad shape. His personal relationship with Annabelle as well had deteriorated over the years. They ended up getting a divorce. And uh, all of that impacted in, in the final days of his career. And really, no nobody at Rastelo, the Valencia Stadium, or at Rebuleira, the Estrela Madura Stadium, never really saw the a glimpse of the of the great Shalana. They always they always saw shadows of, of his greater self. After his playing career, he had short coaching stints, mostly as assistants and caretakers. He managed Oriental in the second division in 2004-2005. He was caretaker at Benfica like in 2002 and 2008 and assistant there from like 2005 to 2009. He was also assistant at uh, Paco Ferreira at 2003-2004. Is it fair to say that full management was not for him perhaps? Yeah, uh, everything started with a divorce with Annabella. They divorced in, in the 90s, and basically she takes him all the money he had uh, with the allowance, with the divorce, and in the end, he ends up with barely nothing in his hands and uh, starts to coach uh, youth teams, most of all youth teams, and uh, Benfica uh, helps him out. So back uh, at mid-90s, he started to coach the under-15, under-16, and 17 teams of Benfica for a long period of time. Uh, he always said he felt comfortable more with the kids, trying to teach them the tricks, the technical tricks, how to behave in the field uh, with uh, more than with the grown-ups. So the few spells he had uh, in the first team of Benfica are more motivated by people in the back room saying it would be important for coaches, especially uh, when Camacho was there because he was foreign, to have an historical figure at his side. It's a very traditional thing in Portuguese football to have when you have a foreign coach to surround him with people that already are at the club or people that are historical figures at the club. Uh, and Shalana was uh, an historical figure at, uh, at Benfica. So in the end, uh, he never got there because he really wanted to pursue a career as a head coach. He never really was trying to build the foundations to one day be the head coach of any given team. He was uh, always very comfortable with the youths. And when you leave uh, Passos Freire, he goes back with Benfica, he was back coaching the under-15, and he starts to coach uh, very younger players that ended up being fundamental in, in Portuguese football nowadays. He was the discovery of Bernardo Silva, for instance. He was the man behind uh, Benfica signing Bernardo and not uh, letting him go because he was also very short and he was a late developer. But Shalane always uh, called him the little Messi from his early days, and he saw a lot of himself in, in Bernardo. Different players, but same attitude, came from the same area, had the same height. So in the end, all the players that Benfica brought through the, the academy at Seychelles uh, in the last years, they always passed through Shalana's hands. Uh, João Cancelo, Gonzalo Guedes, uh, international players uh, of that generation. And he was more comfortable in that role. So in the end, uh, he was really a man not destined to be, to be a head coach not interested in the limelight. He, he really wanted just to stay on the grassroots and to feel football as he felt in, in those early days playing at Barreiro with his friends on the street. And I believe he said that at Benfica, he was seen as a decorative assistant. It's very really usual in Portuguese football, not in Benfica, even Porto and, and sporting, especially with foreign coaches, like to have those decorative figures. So the fans can associate with, and in difficult times, they sometimes appear to appease uh, 
the the public opinion because they are so mythological figures in the club that it's more easier for the fans to not be hard on them and in the way they're like uh, shields for the the coaches in, in a more uh, psychological way we could say can you discuss his final years and untimely death just this past august 10th 2022 at the age of 63 well, unfortunately, he had a degenerative disease uh, that was uh, very evident for the people who knew him well already from a few years ago. So everybody knew he was in terrible shape uh, with losing memory, with uh, losing physical abilities. Uh, Benfica as well uh, was uh, giving him work at the time, but always knowing of his situation. So although he was very young, it was not unexpected for the people who knew him that he was... Uh, not going to live long uh, in the state that he was. And in the end, it was uh, a death very, very typical of him. Never once he appeared to give interviews, to, to put a name on himself. He never used his talents or his career to to make a big fuss around this public figure. He was always on on the shadows, always trying to have the most peaceful and quiet life out of the limelight. And so when he died, uh, all the ones that work with him and that were there with him were aware of his situation. And for the most football fans that um, always go for the, the media stuff and to be uh, on the day, were not aware because he really never made a fuss out of it. But he was uh, ill for the past three, four years. So in the end, it was expected. Looking back... It seems like it was all over for him in 1984 at the end of the Euros, age just 25. And he sadly only gained 27 caps. Do you also think this was the reference point where he was at his absolute height and then just never reached that level, sadly? Yeah, the 80 to 84 period was his. The stardom period and that Benfica team was really a great team and he was performing at his best playing in the wing mostly on on the left wing but also on the right wing because as he was two-footed he could play basically anywhere in some European matches he would play as a as a striker as well to to take advantage of uh, uh, long throws and playing on space but that was the best version that we ever saw of Shalana from the, the away for run in 82 until the year 84. Because after that, all the injuries uh, ended up um, postponing what would have been a, an even greater career in European football with a very good team. He's in the, the Bordeaux team that plays against Juventus, uh, that Euro-Cubian Cup semi-final in, in 85 before the, the Eisel disaster. So that was the point that Bordeaux could have made what Olympic Marseille did a few years later, that is to fight for an European Cup gold medal. But uh, probably his last great match is that one against France in Marseille. Uh, and that is the the image that everybody who loves uh, football and who loves his, his trajectory will have with, uh, as a memory of him as a player. Yeah. So in closing, can he be considered... Portugal's biggest star in the post Eusebio and pre Futre era in those short early years in 1980s. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, there are even people that consider him to be superior to Futre uh, in the sense that he was uh, even more technical and more creative uh, player than Futre. Futre was more a vertical player. Uh, Shalana would recreate himself more with the ball. Futre was always about speed, about looking for space. Uh, Shalana was more of a player looking for others. Uh, and in that sense, uh, there are some that discuss uh, that Shalana is even greater than him. But undoubtedly, in the period that goes between the end of the Eusebio generation of late 60s and the period where Futre wins the European Cup with Porto and then moves to Atletico Madrid in the late 80s, is clearly the greatest footballer in Portuguese history the most talented uh, and certainly one of the greatest figures of the history of the game of those years as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you for this interview.
And I would urge everyone to please read the main blog article as well for more detail. The link is included in the video upload description, along with our respective contact information, as well as links to Mr. Pereira's books. So, Miguel, thank you again. And hope thank to you continue for having these me. discussions on Portuguese football in the future. We will, in, we will for sure. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.